Um, okay, so let's start where we start. Um, for the sake of Yerushalayim, right, in our sikhot, we're going through this process, and for the sake of, and we talked about it a little bit last week, I want to remind us about Avraham Avinu, and like, for those of us who are, are jumping in um, today, so this notion of Avraham Avinu holding each and every one of us in his memory and his consciousness when he was before mitzvot, so we were all familiar with them, and we talked about this question of about accountability. So a man, and, and also this image of standing in, 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 our, in the midst of a community and who's standing to our right, who's standing to our left, who's standing in front of us and behind us, and for the sake of them answer, for the sake of them. Right? So I want to say in the Tzichot, Aseleman Yerushalayim, Aseleman Chaim lo lemaneinu, God, master the world for, for your sake, if not for our sake. So I want us also to be able to, as we're singing the words, of the of the nusach of the of the form of of the sikhot, but also in our minds and in our hearts, who else are we singing aseleman for the sake of for the sake of our children, for the sake of our family, for the sake of our planet, for the sake of we each have for the sake of. So feel free in your heart also to um, to hold that in your heart as we sing. And as you know, um, I can't. Hear you sing, that's the challenge with the Zoom, but I can see your lips moving. So that's how I know whether you're singing with me or not. Um, but it's an invitation, it's a, it's, a, it's a loving invitation, not a demanding one, a uh, loving one. I was accused of being a demanding teacher because I wanted my students to be singing. So I am um, doing tshuva on that, but it's an invitation. Aselemani Yerushalayim, Aselemani Yerushalayim, Aselemani Yerushalayim, Aselemani Yerushalayim, Aseleman Lemancha, Veoshienu. Aseleman le mancha, im lo le manenu. Aseleman le mancha, im lo le manenu. Aseleman le mancha, Aseleman yerusha. Aim, Aseleman, Yerushalayim. Aseleman, Yerushalayim. Aseleman, Yerushalayim. Aseleman, Leman, Ha, Yim, Lo, Leman, Enu. Aseleman, Leman, Ha, Veoshie. One and only divine mother, master of the world. What a gift to be yet again cutting time zones into nowhere, being able to be in each other's homes. What a gift to share this moment. What a gift to be able to say to you, do it for your sake, it's not for our sake. One and only you need us in the way that we need you. We need to forgive you the way you need to forgive us. So may this be a moment of holding each other in, in, in compassion and forgiveness and love and um, in vision and witnessing. And thank you, Rabbi Dan, for bringing us together. I mean, really, who needs to sleep in the middle of the night when you can be sitting and learning Torah together? So what's two o'clock in the morning, two ten in the morning, right? I think Yavani, you're also in this time zone? So, uh, no, I'm actually uh, East Coast now. East Coast, yeah. wow, okay. So there are things I need to know. Um, Maybe you also brought... You also brought me and my mom together, so it's always... Yes, your mom is here. Oh, it's been a while since we've been together. 
Amazing. Okay. So I'm really grateful. And we brought the Mashiloch to be with us. I, one of my, as you can see, one of my more loved Hasidic teachings, sources, Rebbe's, um, one that I believe held me in his heart and his mind when he was teaching and learning. And um, I want to, I want to, I want to share with you this teaching that I brought today. Um, I'm always, I'm, I always bring it with trepidation. Trepidation because um, it can be liberating, it can be painful, it can be opening, it can also leave with a lot of questions, and, and I want to say um, a fair amount of discomfort. So that is a way of also, for a moment, bringing us back to a moment to our first, first source for those of us who have been on this journey, and each class completely stands ind independently. I do want to mention it because we looked at the Talmud on Yoma, Shaktet Yoma 86 um, A and B. Great is, great is Tshuva that brings redemption to the world. Great is Tshuva that reaches the, the throne of glory. We had, right, and we used this paradigm of Tshuva and that can, translation for forgiveness. And the questions of what are we looking for in forgiveness? What are our aspirations in forgiveness? How far do we want to go? How far back do we want to go? How far forward or how far high do we want to go? And one of the uh, paradigms in the name of Rabbi of Resh Lakish that we didn't look at um, was um, greatest tshuva that um, that unintentional that intentional transgressions become unintentional transgressions and intentional transgressions become merit depending on where our forgiveness comes from and um and I, i'd like to say one one um one image is you know when it's only when someone breaks your heart at times that you know actually what kind of what what really what the, what the love was at one point and at one at one time and um and the Gemara there talks about the difference. It talks about, about the notion of the quality of healing. And there is a paradigm in which um, when we do, when we repent out of fear versus out of awe or out of love, right, it's as if someone who, um, who ha had a broken, Rashi says, kebal mum like someone who, for example, had a broke had broke a leg or broke an ankle, God forbid, or God forbid, and it is healed, right? And those who have those broken um, um, bones are the ones I say that they like they know it's healed, but there's always something there. And there's a way in which at times there's there's going to be forgiveness, but there's always going to be something there. Sometimes it's not going to go back to being what it was. And I think that that's also a question of what our expectation is. The truth of the matter is at times it can be even better than what was, stronger than was, right? That ahava element comes in and we can find ourselves reconnecting at an even higher level because I didn't know how dear this person was or I didn't know how dear the situation was. And yet at the same time, sometimes, it's going to be there. There's going to be a memory that's going to be that's going to be there, right? So um, I want to say here with the sources that we're going to look at today. On the one hand, this teaching is such a is such an open an opening teaching, and on the other hand, it's going to ask of us a lot of integrity. I think it's going to also it's going to stretch us at times, discomfort and with discomfort. And I want to say that there's a, there's a challenging word when thinking about uh, forgiveness, which I think holds us um, more accountable to the word compassion. And that is the, the notion of justice. Because sometimes in order to forgive, we're going to have to relinquish an element of justice. which is not easy. Like I'm pausing for a moment because then I can feel in my chest like a tug, 
because at times we so want justice and a sense of until justice is, is done, we're not going to forgive. And, um, and I also, I want to say one thing I need to, I need to put it out there because we, this is our third session together. And, um, and there's something that's, that's very commonly and often said in the, I want to say in the forgiveness industry. So I want to put it out there. Um, it's not something that I say, but it's out there. So I'm aware of it. That's why I'm going to say what I'm saying. People often say, um, teachers of forgiveness talk about the fact that when we don't forgive, the only person we're hurting is ourselves. Have you heard that familiar? Okay, now it's not something that's it's not something I'll ever say, right? There's certain things I'll never say. Why? Because it may be true. And so what? What do I mean by so what? When I eat a cheap piece of cheesecake, I also know it's not good for me. But I'll still have that cheesecake. Or I'll still go in and buy that ice cream cone, even though like not. So I want to say that sometimes knowing that something isn't necessarily the healthiest option in our lives doesn't mean that we're going to act upon it. And, and therefore, I want to say um, it may be true that the one that is most harmed is ourselves, but that's a choice we also make. And I want to say that that's a, a, it's a valid choice. But it's, it's like so many stories in our lives that we hold on to as long as they serve us. Serve us for a plethora of reasons. And, and, I, want to, and I want to acknowledge that as well. And I want to acknowledge also um, one last thing. And that is, you know, the Talmud in the tractate of um, Brachot, and, and some of us have had the gift of learning that, that specific sugya um, together, when we learned uh, theology of Masechet Brachot at Ziegler together, that when the Talmud talks about Yisurim Shel um, afflictions of love, and God afflicts us, afflicts us, you know, on, the, on, on 5a, on the tractate of Brachot, on 5a talks about this beautiful notion of afflictions of love, that God wants to grant us with such amazing gifts in the world to come and therefore afflicts us in this world so that we have this amazing reward waiting in the, world, in the world to come for us. And what I love about the Talmud there is that when you flip the page, I just turn the page, and the same sages that are talking about how this notion of affliction of love, Rabbi Yochanan says on the second page, when he's suffering, lohen v'loschagad. I don't want the suffering, and I don't want the reward. So I want to say on 5A, it's very nice to be sitting around the table and bringing in sources and verses and teachings about this notion of affliction of love. I think God wants, loves us so much and therefore we're suffering so that in the world to come, we'll be, we have reward. But when Rabbi Yochanan himself is suffering, right? On the, when you flip the page, life moves from the table to the reality. And he says, not them nor their reward. I also want to say, especially when bringing in this teaching today, that um, these are teachings to sit with. These are just teachings to grapple with. I also want to say, to allow them to have a present, um, to know that they're, they're a possibility, to know that they're an option. Often people talk about the difference between descriptive and prescriptive. I want to. I want to. I want to suggest it. I want to know something to grapple with, something to think about, something to contemplate, something to entertain. Maybe something to try on, and then we can decide: comfortable or not comfortable. Also true. Okay. So the first is you have the Hebrew and you have the English. There is um, the first teaching. They're both from the Mashilach, both from the Ishbitz Rebbe. We're in Poland to the first half of the 19th century. Ishbitzer Rebbe was a student of the Kotzko Rebbe, known for his passion, for his fire. And he's going to start it out on the, on, on, on the Pasuk, Velo tonu ishit amito meruhecha. And you shall not wrong one another, and you shall fear God. Now, I will say 
the Gemara in Bava Metzia will teach us that this notion of the, the verse that ends with Ve'aretem Elokecha, and you shall fear God, appears six times in the Torah, and appears six times when dealing with elements that I want to say are tricky in terms of our motives. Hadavar Masur Lalev, these are elements in which our intentions are, um, are, are terms of the heart, meaning to say the following. Um, sometimes a comment is actually an insult. And only the person who is delivering the, the compliment will know whether they meant to compliment or they meant to insult. Right? Sometimes um, you may offer um, help, but it's not sincere. It makes you look good. It makes you sound good. It makes you appear like you're caring. But really, you don't really have an intention to really get in the car right now and show up, for example. Right? So Here in the same, in the same uh, chapter in Vayikra, we have twice, we have this notion of frauding. Um, and the Talmud will deal here with the question, why does this verse appear twice? And once it tells us, well, one is a monetary fraud, and one is what's called onat dvarim. One is fraud with our words, fraud with our intention, fraud, I had a question of that challenges our integrity at times. And when the Pasuk says, God, because the Pasuk, the, the, the sages of the Talmud will tell us, because at the end of the day, the only one that knows is you and God. Right? There are certain, certain moments that are between us and the one and only. So, for example, here, the, um, the Mea Shiloh, that's the name of his book, The Waters of the One, the Ishbitzer Rebbe, because he comes from Ishbitzer. He's going he's gonna to, first of all, bring us into the notion of, of tochecha, of rebuke. Right? Because he feels that rebuke comes from a place of having a sense of knowing what is right and what is right for the other person. Having a sense in our tradition, we have, a, we have two mitzvot, which is a challenge for him. On the one hand, we have mitzvah of tochecha, we have the mitzvah of rebuking, we also have the mitzvah of vahavtar recha kamocha, of loving the other like ourselves. And there's a way in which he feels that there is a challenge here in terms of tochecha comes from a place of knowing. We know what the Torah tells us. We know what the Torah commands us. And if we see someone transgressing, then don't we have an obligation for tochacha? Don't we have an obligation to help them walk the path, whatever that path is, right here, the path of the Torah, the path of the mitzvot. So that's the challenge that the Mashiach has. And I want to say, and I, and I love the fact that he starts with saying, this verse, you shall not wrong one another, you shall fear, and you shall fear your God. This verse is also directed to great and precious souls who see another going against God's will. So what happens when you, um, when you, a teacher, a rabbi, here, I'll give you an example of what this looks like in terms of, 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 of the um, fineness of the attunement that's being asked of us. Do you quote a source? Right. Teacher, rabbi, do you quote a source so that, and that makes you look smart? It makes you look knowledgeable? Do you quote a source so actually people can then go look it up? Very fine, very fine. 
um, when you're learning and you find some a sign of a source, you say, wow, this is amazing. Or I need to hold on to this because if I quote this, they're going to think that I'm the most amazing teacher. Do you quote it so people think you're amazing? Do you quote it because you want people to learn that teaching? Do you quote the source because you want people to look it up? Do you want people to think, well, oh, she's so erudite. She even knows exactly where it appears on the Talmud. So, and, and here, and here, so the, the Ishmael's Rebbe says, like, people of greatness, right? They also have this, they have this critical eye. They have this, do you, do you correct someone because you want the world to know that you are actually very uh, strict about that specific mitzvah? Or do you actually want a person to, to embrace it in a different way? We're, none of us, none of us are safe from this question of fraud in our words, fraud in our attentions. And actually, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Adam Greenwald, he once said to me, in a, pro, in a post-Freudian era, can we ever know what our intentions really are? It's a great question. Like, can we? Maybe not, but maybe, maybe we can, that doesn't, that doesn't let us off the hook either. I want to say that as well. So we have an understanding of what God's will is, and then, and we want to act from that place. But it appears that God's not too happy with that notion. On this, the Vida Melech, and he quotes here, uh, King David in Tehillim 50, uh, verses 20 and 21. He says, you do these things. You think that you, you great person, you great teacher, you wise one, think that you know what God wants, you know God's will. The truth of the matter is, you sit and speak against your brother. You slander your mother's son. You have done these things. And I stood in silence. Wow. So you thought I was the same as you. Therefore, I will prove you and set them in order before your eyes. Actually, it's a hard notion of covering up here. Meaning to say, you, great teacher, you, great scholar, you see someone doing something which you think is not God's will, and you're going to rebuke them because you think that's my will, God is saying. But honestly, my will is silence. Why? Because if I was to stand each and every person in front of me, there is no one without sin. There is no one without transgression. But I, the master of the world, I don't go around, if I can speak in this very anthropomorphic language, I don't go around with a, 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 a Torah in one hand and saying, okay, Rabbi Mimi, you, you did this wrong, and you did this wrong, and you did this wrong, and there's a different. Rabbi Dan, you did this wrong, and there's a different. Right? On the contrary, God withholds in silence. As if, didn't see it. As if it didn't happen, right? There's, I want to say, there's a holy cover, covering up. Now I said, and I preface by saying, like this is a this is a very tricky teaching because at times, covering up means that that there's injustice in the world. So I also want to I also want to say that, that we have the right to, to also be very careful in how we use this teaching. But first, to know that there is this possibility, right? So um, the notion, and you'll see that what God does, tashlich, we do tashlich on Rosh Hashanah. It's if we throw our transgressions into the ocean, into a live body of water, as if they're gone, they're not there. They're not part of us. Right? God's compassion is that God doesn't judge us. So I wanna, I wanna, I wanna take a step back for a moment, and also, and also think of you know when I was when I was growing up, there we in the Tana Tokif, right that moment of saying reciting the Tana Tokif, and we are like God is like a shepherd, and each one of us walks by. Right, and there's that moment of judgment. So I want to say, as a kid, I used to try to imagine 
did that moment happen yet? Did it happen yet? Because if it happened, then I can don't have to be my best behavior anymore. You know, if like it happened in the evening, then like I'm okay all day. But if it didn't happen until in the ELA, I'm like, oh my God. So there's like this notion of that. But I want to say here, there's a different way of thinking about it. And that's not trepidation, but love. That may be all year round, we feel not seen by God. But there's going to be one moment that God sees us. And here the Meshilah is offering us already a perspective of saying, God doesn't see us in judgment, but sees us in love. And then the question of our actions and our deeds are a question of, right, the greater the love, maybe the greater the expectation or the greater the love, the greater the desire. Like, what do we really want of this relationship with the one and only? What do we want with this relationship with this other person? What do we want with our relationship with ourselves? Right? And some of this element of forgiveness and compassion that we're learning together, that will, that will um, inform what we really want of the relationship what we really want of the person. And sometimes that means um, to wink, you know? There's a, I have this phrase, I, 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 I call it a wink though, right? Not a window, but a wink though. Now, there's something, we use wink as, a, as an endearment at times. We use the wink to make a certain kind of statement. When we wink, we only see with one eye, not with two eyes. And at times, we're going to need to wink. We're going to need to need to transform our perspective when thinking about this element of forgiveness and compassion. And here, the Mashilah is going to say, "You speak against your brother, you slander, right? You think you're obligated to do this." But actually, for the Mashi law, therefore, in section number three, therefore God says, you have done all these things, and I stood by in silence. Because if God sees fit, and you can see bold letters, and bold, fit to clarify matters, even the actions of the tzaddikim will not be meritorious. Because who can say, my motives, right? Who can say, every time I teach, it's only for the sake of God. Every time I quote a source, it's only so that you know where, how to, where to find it. Every time I offer a help, it's only, only because I really mean it in the moment. We can't. The human condition is we can't always even be honest with ourselves. And sometimes, honestly, it's easier to forgive someone else than to forgive ourselves. I also want to throw that in the equation as well, right? How could we not know? How could we put ourselves in that situation again? How could we allow it to be? I, I want to say at times, and there are moments that I think that forgiving ourselves is the hardest. Forgiving God is the hardest. Forgiving someone else as hard as it is, sometimes I think it is the easiest of the options. Because God, you should know better. Mimi, you should know better, right? Forgiving myself, forgiving God, sometimes is much harder than actually forgiving someone else. So first I wanna say that there's an invitation for a moment for silence. Meaning to say, what would it be to sit with that person in a moment of silence? The silence also, for me, is an invitation to vulnerability. So many times we use our words to fill in actually the gap or the chasm between us and another person, between us and a situation. 
in a moment of silence allows for the situation to be what it is in its magnitude. And then we can entertain and enter into a process of forgiveness or entertain a moment of, of, um, of compassion. There's, um, there's a story, there's a story of the Piyasat Rebbe that um, a heartbreaking story, and it's a story though that I walk with in many other many situations. Um, the story is that the Piyasat Rebbe in the Warsaw Ghetto was out of Mohel, and um, in the last winter that he was in the, in the ghetto, he was asked to come do a Brit Milah. You can imagine a Brit Milah um, in, the, in the winter of 41, 42, uh, winter of 42. And um, so it's late, it's in the middle of the night and he takes another 10 men with him. So there'll be a minyan. One of them was a doctor. He wanted to make sure that everything would be okay. And the doctor actually survived to tell the story. Um, when they walked into the home, the mother of the baby started screaming and immediately they, they hushed her because you're screaming in the middle of the night in the ghetto. It's clear that you're drawing attention. She was screaming. And they finally they silenced her. And I said, why did you start screaming when we walked in? She said that when, there, when her son was born eight days before, she and her husband decided that they were not going to do a brit milah. That they were going to try to smuggle the baby out of the ghetto to save the baby's life. She said that morning, her husband was taken away. And she decided to do the brit as a way of intervening in the heavens on his behalf. Then when the Rebbe walked in, she understood the magnitude of her decision. Because if she did this brit in order to intervene on, on, the, on behalf of her husband in the heavens, that meant, though, that her, her son would now be recognized as a Jewish boy. And the ability to save him now was compromised. So, and yet she did the brief. I bring the story because it, this cry that she had, there's a moment that we need to be able to cry together. There's a moment that the silence is crucial for the acknowledgement of the situation. So there's a way in which I wanna say for me personally, right? If someone would come to apologize for hurting me, I would say I need a moment for the two of us to be, sit here in silence. Before, before we can embrace, before I can, before I can let go. Right? The science to hold the space of what was and what is. The master of the world is silent. Now I want to say it's godly. It's godly. And I think the Ishbut Rebbe here is saying that forgiveness is godly. As a human being, we have every reason in the world not to forgive. The pain was real or is real. The insult was real or is real. The ramifications, the outcome, the years of, fill that, and you can fill that sentence, they're real. As human beings, we have every reason, I think. I tell myself, right, when, it's, when I don't want to forgive. When not, it's not even a question of whether I, if I can or can't. Maybe I can and I don't want to. It's human to be challenged by this notion of forgiveness. It's godly. It's tapping into a part of our godliness, the Mashilach is saying. Being godly isn't judging. Being godly is forgiving. 
Okay? Being godly isn't judging. Being godly isn't holding a book of rights and wrongs, of mitzvot and avirot. Being godly is tapping into a place of forgiveness. Now, how do we do that? And he's going to, he's going to tell us also how to do that. But I want to pause for a moment. Thoughts, comments, reflections. Yes, I wasn't raising my hand. I was just giving so much love for the teaching, as always. It's so beautiful and heart opening to that. Okay, thank you. Because I, I saw the heart. I thought the heart was your way of raising your hand. Thank you. Because we have this, right? But I just want to say something. This image came to me because when you do this for love, for a heart, that means that you can't hold on to something else with one hand because you need both hands to make it. Laura, Laura, I'm glad that you raised what you just did, because I think that you'd mentioned justice early in our session together. And I think that what holds people back from effective forgiveness is bitterness at their own injustice and the unwillingness to realize the dynamics of the situation. You know, yes, I can accept that apology, but I'm still wronged. Um, I can let this go, but I can't. There's, there's a tension in this. Yes, yes, yes. And, um, and that tension will sit with us. And I also, I also wanna say that in order for the forgiveness to be um, real, we also have to be willing to surrender and to let go of that. And that's also true. And I do want to quote myself um, of what I said three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and that is, like in the like in the world of uh, of Mother Earth, Orla, Netarevai, Shmita, Yovel, right? Some fruits. It's a question of three years and four years until we can actually eat the fruits. There's a Shmita. There's a seven-year cycle. There's a Yovel, which is a forty-nine, and then a fifty-year cycle. It may also be. It may also be. Um, not yet. Not this Rosh Hashanah, not this Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. You know, I was always joked that I, I never understood a bride and groom that, that get married like a week before Rosh Hashanah. Why? Because in our tradition, the day of the wedding um, is, is like Yom Kippur and all your sins are atoned. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're doing this like a right a week before Yom Kippur. It's like, no, like do it in the middle of the year. I'd have your be a bride, be a groom be in, a, in the middle of the year. And then like, it's a halfway, make the most of it. But, so I also want to say here, it may be not the right time, not yet, not yet. That's also true. My dear, your hand is up. And on my screen, you're sitting right next to me. Not just on your screen. Um, my heart, you're always with me. Um, it's so good to be learning with you right now. I'm thinking about a particular situation in my life uh, where someone really, really wants my forgiveness. And uh -huh. I have felt very called to silence. I have felt uh, the silence feels like, like a healthy boundary in a way. Um, and I also don't want to be fooled into thinking like I I think that my anger lives in that silence and I don't want to be fooled into thinking I'm like so like I'm better than her I'm like you know like any other ways my anger might confuse me um but I think that anger is also giving me that silence and I I I don't know how to discern kind of when the, it's the time of the silence of, okay, I'm going to hold it. And now we're moving like now. Yes. Like I hear you and I welcome you and our relationship will change, but we will be in relationship or whether um, I need to like still be here. Like I need to not go there yet. Right. Um, oh, wow. I hear it. 
And the good thing about, I want to say about talking about forgiveness and compassion is, is that we all know what we're talking about in different, we all have in different gradations and different situations, but right, we're, um, it's, it's real, it's real. So I, um, I want to, I want to bring the godliness into it for a moment. And I want to bring the lotomu ishit amito vireta melokecha into into our learning. I want to re- re- hold on to this pasuk, um, and that is to say yes and yes, meaning to say that the challenge that the mashidoch is going is to offer offer you and us is to ask ourselves every time what's the silence. It's not, it's not, it's, it, it's like a pendulum, right? It, it's sometimes the signs are going to be one and sometimes the signs are going to be the other. I don't think we, forgiveness is a one-time act. I don't think in a situation we, like this forgive and forget, right? We forgive and we forget, right? There's, I don't think so. Right? It's a give and take. Right? In their learning, it's a give and take. And in a relationship, it's a give and take. It's a push me, pull you. And it's a seesaw. Right? And the seesaw, like at different times, people on each side pull their weight differently. And it also may be that the different qualities of the, of the silence are going to be a different reflection of what you feel as you're mirroring from the other person. There's also a partnership that happens in the forgiveness process. Right? It is rare. I'm trying to even think if I've ever heard of the situation. I'm thinking about this for the first time because of your question. Right? I'm trying to think if there was ever a situation in which someone hurt me, and before they came to ask for forgiveness, and it's something that we both knew, we both know of the situation, and that I actually went to them before they came to ask for forgiveness and said, I want you to know I forgive you. I can't even, I can't, Im- I can't imagine, definitely anyone who knows me knows, but I can't even imagine that situation. Right? So, but like, is that science? Do I want them to stew in it or do I want them to own it? It's again. And, and I think, and I think we're going to be continuously. It's going to be both. Dear one, I think it's going to be both. There are going to be moments of our, of our, of our higher self. There are going to be moments of our human self. And that's where we need compassion to ourselves as well. Right, and and sometimes my sense of self needs that self righteousness. And sometimes my self of self, that sense of self, I need I need that self respect. Right, because there was something about the word self righteousness that I felt I heard myself saying and saying, mm. "What about the self respect?" And I want to say sometimes when we feel that being stepped on then we need to be for ourselves even more zealous, zealous about our own self-respect. That's also true. Would you say that again, that last teaching? I said sometimes I feel that when our, uh, when we feel walked on, walked over, that we need to be zealous about our self-respect. And that's also, so I want to say this, don't, don't wrong your friend and fear God and be attentive to your heart can also be a sense of um, why am I not forgiving? It's not because the other person isn't worthy of forgiveness or isn't deserving of forgiveness or that I'm not able to forgive. But right now, I need to be tender with my self-respect. Um, and that means that I'm going to hold on to not forgiving for another moment, not because I can't forgive, not because I don't want to forgive, 
but because my self-respect needs of me to honor myself. Right? Because there's, I want to say in the forgiving piece, there's going to be also a question of how do we honor ourselves in that process. Yeah, there are a couple of hands out there. Yeah, Marilyn Duff. The, one of the challenges for forgiving is how do you handle not forgetting? You forgive the situation, but it's hard to forget it. Right. So, here's a trick. And I tried it last night, last night, two nights ago at four o'clock in the morning. We can, we can feel multiple feelings simultaneously, but we can only think one thought at the same time. So what does it mean to think a different thought? The forgetting, uh, what, what, I, what, I, what I mean to say is, um, we, have, we have choices about how we wanna work with our memory. Sometimes we repeat the story over and over and over again to make sure that we don't forget. And that's a choice we make. So when I find myself coming back to going over the story again in my head, and then I say, okay, um, can you please invite yourself to think something different right now? Right? So I have two tricks. One is to write it down and let the paper hold on to it. Okay. Now I did this for the first time, like really, really when six years after my father crossed over, I was 24 when my father crossed over and six years later, I actually sat down and I wrote a 120 page memoir, which was never published, but I sat down, I wrote 120 pages of the last week of his life because I couldn't move on in my life in any way because I would go over those, that, those last six weeks over and over and over and over and over because I didn't want to forget one detail. This is a positive example. And I sat down and I wrote so that I knew that the I knew that these 120 pages held those memories. And and and, and then I didn't I could go back to reading it. But I want to say I can do the same with that with that with the hard memories. Right? I can write it down, let the paper hold on to it. So I don't have to go over that story again and again and again, which sometimes is what stands between me and forgiveness. Um and I want to say we can we can we we can practice that there's someone, a someone that you really trust. Can you, um, can you give them the story to hold for you for a minute? See what it feels like to be without that weight. And the, the most personal example that I can give is, is um, actually uh, at a wedding, right? One of the um, one of the brides at the time, there was a complicated relationship with a parent. And it was almost like in their mind, impossible to walk with them to the chuppah, but it was going to happen. And I said to them, here's the deal. I'm going to make a deal with you. For the duration of the wedding, I'm taking the relationship on. For the duration of the wedding, I'm going to hold on to the complicated relationship. You? Walk to the chuppah with your parents. And you dance with your parents. And you celebrate with your parents. I said, I promise you at the end of the wedding, I'm giving you back the relationship. I'm not going home with it. But for the duration of the wedding, don't carry it. I'll carry it for you. I want to, I want to offer this as, a, as an experiment feel what it feels like to be without it. I want to say to consciously forget. 
right? Instead of consciously remembering, to consciously forget, to actively forget. Wow, I told you it's godly to actively forget. These are these are these are I want to say experiments, and we're the we're the scientists, and we're also the mouse in the in the in the, in the, in the trap. Like we're both, and we may not be able to, or we may we may need to augment the experiment in order for it to be. It may be that we need to find the the person that really understands the depth of the transgression the depth of the insult, the depth of the hurt. We need maybe we need to fine tune who that person is that we can ask them to hold on to it. Um, Pesach. Okay, guys. Pesach. Um, rabbi Mickey Rosen, a blessed memory, was the only rabbi that would do this with me. You know when you go to the rabbi and you sell your chametz? I would put relationships on the page. There are relationships that I would sell for Pesach. Meaning to say, this relationship is Hametz. I can't do the work. I can't do the fixing before Pesach. So I'm going to put it aside for a week. You know, I'm going to lock it in the closet for a week. When Pesach is over, I got to do the work. I got six months between Pesach and Rosh Hashanah and people to do the work. But for that week, I'm saying moratorium, I'm not working on it. I can't work on it. I can't cleanse it. I can't fix it. That relationship has hummus. I'm going to put in the closet for a week. So coming back to that question of silence. Right? Is that silence like putting it away for a week? Putting it away for the duration of the bar mitzvah for the duration of the wedding, for the duration of the family reunion, for Thanksgiving. Putting it away, putting it aside. Possible. Okay. Um, the Mashi law. How does he want us to look at this? How dear, does he want us to entertain this possibility? And this is what he says Towards the end. So we know now that godliness is, is silence. Godliness is not necessarily judging. Godliness is this element of tashlich, of covering up. Right? There's something so amazingly powerful of the metaphor of throwing breadcrumbs into, the, into a live body of water. What was our transgression is now someone else's food. Right now the fish will eat those breadcrumbs. What symbolizes what is a metaphor for our transgression now becomes their food, their vitality. Many ways to think about what happens in Tashka. Again, what we can learn sometimes that transgression that brings us to a closer element of endearment. The Ishbut to Rebbe says the following. Wow. Look at section number seven, the last section. Even though God indeed commanded man or, or a person, the translation is I took off uh, Sepharia, um, even though a person is commanded to reprove their neighbor when they see something is wrong, right? This is only in a possible, it's only possible in a place where he clearly, they clearly know they can help them bring them to the good. In other words, there are situations which, how do we, can a person really, can, it really can, it, can shift really happen, right? And that's also, that's also a question in terms of the forgiveness. Sometimes the forgiveness comes from a place, not because I know that they're going to change, but, but I know that because they can't. I'm not able. So why am I going to hold on to this? Right? Sometimes we don't forgive because we're waiting for change to happen. And when that, then we'll, when we see they really changed. When, they, when we see that they're really other. But what happens if they really can't? They really can't. 
Now my father may rest in peace. He smoked three packs of cigarettes a day for 30 years. As I say, it's a recipe for cancer of the esophagus that doesn't fail. Someone said to me, aren't you angry at your father? Right? That was a cancer that he could have, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He could have, I lost my word in English. Um, right? As if he's responsible for it. And I said, no. I said, he tried a million times. To, he did it. hypnosis. He did every possible thing to stop smoking. And he couldn't. And this is the way he went through life. And this is the way he could be present. And this is the way he could father. And this is the way he could love. And this is the way he, right? He couldn't be other. He couldn't be other. But I want to say at times, forgiveness happens when we understand. This is who the person is. Wow, does it mean that we're condoning their actions? Not necessarily. Again, that justice piece, we're not supporting it, we're not honoring it, but we're, we're seeing it for what it is. We're seeing the person for who they are, not the person we want them to be, but for who they are. Thank you, a compassionate response. Yes, and he's, he's, he's asking here for that, I think. So one is, and then he says, why is this? I'm taking two minutes of our time, three minutes of our time. Um, he says, because one is, we do this if we know that we can, we can help them shift or through prayer. Like, who do we carry in our prayers? Right, so coming back when you're into to my response, Right, as a way of saying, oh, I can either tell the story over or I can pray on their behalf. So I said, like in the middle of the night, four o'clock in the morning, two nights ago, when I found myself going over the story of this person that I'm waiting for them to call me to apologize. Right, and I have like four different uh, four different responses that are waiting. I just don't know which one I'm going to use when they actually do. Right. Um, when I found myself going over the story at four o'clock in the morning, I said, okay, time to think something different. So here, time to pray. Try to pray. Time to pray. Try to hold, try to hold the situation in prayer. Try to hold the person in prayer. Try to hold myself in prayer. Or perhaps, right? Because why sometimes he says the Ephraim, their evil inclination, their challenge is greater than my challenge. I don't even know how challenged they were in that situation. And he says, and if we didn't get that, he says, he says, and this is why I think this teaching is so um, demanding of us and challenging. He says, or perhaps what he sees is an, as an error or sin is actually permitted to their neighbor. For there are many things that are forbidden to one, but permitted to another. Meaning to say, there's a way in which for the Ishbet Rebbe, we will never really understand what we see. Maybe in that moment, it was the best that they could do. Maybe in that moment, when they hurt us, they were drowning in a way that we don't even know. And their action was, was actually trying to save them and on our expense. Now, I pause because my stomach is like saying to me, whoa, did you hear what you said a moment ago? Do you understand the magnitude of what the Ishbet Rebbe is asking of you? Right? And when, I try, when the insult, when the hurt is raw and is in front of us, this teaching, maybe not, maybe it's too soon for the teaching. Maybe too soon for, the, for, the possi for this possibility. And I also want to say we have options. One is to, is to say um, they couldn't do better than this. One is to say, one is to pray. One is to say in that moment, it was their lifesaver. And, and maybe I can understand it in the context of that specific moment, but not as a behavior. I can see it as a reaction, but not as a pattern. 
that too can open me up to possibilities. So I really want to hold coming back to where we started in terms of this notion of godliness and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. I want to say it's not only a question of forgiving someone else forgiving a situation, I want to say at times it's a question of forgiving ourselves. Forgiving ourselves for, for being in a certain situation. Being, forgiving ourselves for repeating a certain modality in our own being. And I do also want to say um, forgiving God. Forgiving God is also, is also on the table for me. God, you should know better. God, you should take care of me like a loving and doting parent. You should. You you can. You should. Why didn't you? Where were you? We had that where were you question, right, which is always there, lurking, always. But also in our individual personal lives. I also want to say, um, in that moment of I want to, I want to pray that in that moment um, that we can also stand in God's presence and hold that silence in God's presence with God as well. Right there, when the Talmud says there are three partners to every birth and there's the two parents and, and the divine, I want to say there's like in every situation, right? There are at least, at least two people, if not more, and the situation. And the multiple situations. So, like, and the, the compassion, the compassion component in this process of forgiveness and justice and restorative justice and and yeshuva dav and peace of mind and, and sleeping and sleeping peacefully at night and allowing allowing you know the planet to rest as well. In this, in this, um, you know, I think, uh, I think COVID, for example, is a way in which our planet rested in that silence as well and was raging at the same time. And so I think it's another paradigm to be thinking about, to be working with as we enter into this period. And um, again, I want to, I want to thank Beth L and I want to thank Rabbi Dan for, um, I want to say for sitting together in Yerushalayim and for hearing me, and for witnessing me, and for sitting in those moments of silence together that really birthed our learning, these three sessions. And I know we'll change my Rosh Hashanah and my Yom Kippur, and I know that there's one person that I may be a bit kinder when they actually reach out to ask for forgiveness. <laughs> I, pray, I pray that I can, uh, I can at least have a moment of silence and a moment, a moment of godliness in this plaza. And I'll hold on to um, the accountability of all of us sitting here and learning together when that email arrives. And I bless us to be courageous and to be self-loving and, um, and to partner with God even for a moment. A moment with God is, a, is really an eternity. And I love you guys so much. And I don't want this to end. And Blocks and time, it's another kind of mitat, mitat stone, right? Uh, the, the bed of stone, like, okay, you have an hour. Okay, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to do the dirty, which means I'm going to sit here. I'm going to say closing wrestling, and then each one of you, you'll turn, you'll, you'll leave when you leave, and I'll sit here. I can't, I can't leave. Um, divine mother, one and only. Beloved, challenging one. Thank you for never giving up on us and know that we never give up on you. And together, this journey teaches us actually those moments of forgiveness and compassion teach us how alive and real and human we are. Thank you for the challenge of it and thank you for the strength of it.